His mother saith to the waiters, Whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye. Words taken from the gospel today for the second Sunday after Epiphany. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the Gospels, we find that Our Lady spoke seven times. The number of perfection. She spoke perfectly. And in the book of St. James, we know that the one who is able to control his tongue and speak well is perfect. She spoke seven times. Two times to the angel Gabriel at the Annunciation. Two times to St. Elizabeth at the visitation, the greeting, and the other was her Magnificat. She spoke one time at the finding of his majesty in the temple, which we heard last Sunday, Son, why hast thou done so to us? And finally, she spoke two times at Cana in Galilee, which we heard this morning. This means the last recorded word of Our Lady in the Gospel is, Whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye. Whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye. Now, by the power of the Holy Ghost, the word was made flesh from this woman, the Blessed Virgin. And in keeping with today's gospel about marriage, we might note that among the first things the incarnate word did, accomplished, was this. He prevented St. Joseph from divorcing Blessed Mary, his wife. No sooner was he incarnate than he put an end to divorce. He prevented St. Joseph from divorcing Blessed Mary, his wife. Divorce had reached such a stage that it was getting into the Holy Family. So his majesty did away with divorce while he was still in his mother's womb. That's amazing. He did not let any time pass. No, he came to preserve the bond of marriage and raise it to a sacrament. After some 30 years, the same incarnate word conceived in Mary's womb had yet to be proclaimed openly, to be spoken publicly. And so this virgin of virgins now opens the way for this to happen at a marriage, no less. So shortly after Cana, his majesty preached publicly his first word, the Sermon on the Mount. In other words, at this marriage, with its miracle, our Lord's public ministry begins. We know that. Again, this indicates how central to the plan of God is holy matrimony. If someone, namely the devil, wants to upset God's plan, well, look no further than upsetting marriage and family life. Need we say more about what's going on in the world right now? Now, as you know, His Majesty's public preaching came to an end on Calvary with his last word being, it is consummated. Then the divine word made man, the seed of God, was buried in the ground only to rise up eternally fruitful on the third day. Surely there's a connection between the beginning of the gospel about Cana on the third day. There was a marriage in Cana. Anyway, he rose up on the third day, eternally fruitful. All that remained then was for the same word to be promulgated worldwide so that the fruit of eternal life might be given to as many as would receive it. To make this promulgation possible, not surprisingly, the Holy Ghost came down once again to overshadow the woman through whom the word was made flesh and later through whom was openly made known. The second overshadowing enabled the apostles surrounding her to preach the gospel without fear unto the ends of the earth and with great zeal. Oh, how important it is to be a child of this woman, to know her and to love her. She always leads us safely to her son, ever saying, 
Whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye. Now for our edification today, there's much to learn here. Much to learn here. Most notably in how Blessed Mary acted in working with God and man. Of importance is the right ordering of charity in Blessed Mary. She spoke perfectly because her whole being, her whole life, is ordered perfectly. She put his majesty, Jesus, she put him first. She put others second, and she put herself last. We've talked about this, J-O-Y, J for Jesus, O for others, Y for yourself. In saying, whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye, she does not force our Lord's hand, but refers all to him. She took note of the needs of others, as seen by her calling attention to the lack of wine. But she did not make him serve their needs above his own designs. He must come first. He is in charge. Whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye. Second of all, we notice how once his majesty has been made known through this miracle, what happens to the blessed mother? She kind of pulls back. She steps back such that we do not hear from her again. She puts herself last. Thus, at Pentecost, where she is the central figure that the Holy Ghost comes down upon to overshadow a second time, as all the great works of art of the Pentecost display, they always put the Blessed Mother in the middle and the fire coming down upon her and then upon all the apostles. Nevertheless, she keeps the lowest place because she makes no notice of it in the Bible. Even though it was only through her that the power from on high descended upon those present. That's the common teaching of the saints and the doctors. He must increase and I must decrease. As we have learned, once again, lasting and eternal joy comes from putting Jesus first, others second and yourself last. When we do this, water can be changed into wine. Tears can turn into laughter. Now, reflecting on what we have learned since Christmas, let's get real practical today in relation to marriage. We know the ordering of joy. J-O-Y is none other than the cross. It's the love of God in the vertical first, then the love of neighbor second, elevated by the love of God. You get the cross. And this same ordering is very helpful in understanding marriage as God intended it. Now let us consider two practical applications. First, it helps solve a common problem many are facing at this time. What to do when a family member or friend, that's Catholic, has invited us to a wedding we know is not approved by God or by his holy church. In the old days, such people, they knew that wasn't right and they just eloped. They don't do that anymore. Now they insist on inviting everyone to participate in their invalid wedding. The gospel today shows us what to do. In other words, this first sacramental marriage gives us what is needed to put order. God first. Other second, yourself last. At this first wedding, the mother of God and his majesty, Jesus Christ, the king, along with his disciples, were invited. Each of these persons stands for something. The blessed mother's presence means the wedding is of the church, which she symbolizes. She's a perfect type and image of the holy church. She's its mother. So in other words, this is according to her laws. Blessed Mother's there. The presence of Jesus means a validly ordained priest with the proper faculties must witness the exchange of vows. The disciples' presence means there are witnesses. 
By the way, with those three things present, you have a valid marriage. To make it perfect, however, we need to be in front of the altar. The water turned into wine means the wedding is made best made before the altar of sacrifice. So that the first thing the married couple does together is to attend the Holy Mass and receive communion. All this shows that the couple are getting married to do God's bidding, to do the work of God on earth. To fulfill his rights and to bring him glory. J comes first. Now, to be very practical, here are some things that we should do with our family and friends. Tell them now, before they ever get engaged, I will not attend any marriage of a Catholic where His Majesty and His Blessed Mother are not invited as they were at Cana. Are you going to invite Jesus? Good, then I'll come. If you're not, I'm not coming. Let them know ahead of time. Tell them that we must serve God first and man second, including our own blood relatives. Even though a loved one may run away to get married, at least they now have a sign, namely are not attending the wedding, that this is wrong. This sign will remain in their hearts, allowing an entry point for a future grace of conversion. The tearful waters of parents and friends and relatives will be made into wine of refreshment when the conversion comes in due time. We must not participate in another sin. We must give them a chance to convert and be an instrument of God. Should I go to the wedding? Yes, if the ordering of J-O-Y is observed. If it is not, do not go and do not participate in their sin. As hard as this may sound, this is the path of true love. And that path is of the cross. And it leads to eternal life, not happiness and unity in a family on earth that will die and go to hell. Second of all, second very practical application. Try to get across how important this ordering is. You can apply it to so many things in your life and overcome so many problems. Okay, second application. The ordering of charity according to J-O-Y puts a marriage on the solid foundation of God's love. The love that St. Paul calls the bond of perfection. So what's a marriage for? To love and serve God. What must be at the heart of every marriage? God. What is the most important and intimate part of a marriage? Love of God. I wonder how many would say that today. Would they not rather say the marital act is the most intimate and important part of a marriage. And that is precisely why so many are getting divorced today. There has been a terrible leveling of all hierarchy and ordering in the world. And that includes things of marriage and family. So let's consider for a moment the marital act itself and see whether this ordering applies. Traditionally, this intimate act has three purposes, and they are hierarchically arranged. They're in a specific order, and it must be followed. And not surprisingly, this hierarchy matches the ordering of J-O-Y perfectly. The first one. The main purpose for this act is procreation, the generation and raising of children. A couple cooperates with God to bring forth new life, to bring forth saints to populate heaven. It takes three to make a baby. It takes God, it takes husband, and it takes wife. Keeping this in mind, couples should always approach this act with awe and even some fear. 
regardless of whether or not they are fertile or able to have children. This is the primary purpose of this act. This is for God. As strange as that may sound to our modern ears, it is true. God must come first. Then comes the second reason, namely the mutual love and support the couple provide each other in raising children to be saints. This act of love is designed by God to unite the couple in a common cause. That they have become one flesh and a child. That they're walking together to heaven. God comes first, others second. Our goal is to populate heaven. That's an awesome responsibility. It's an awesome thing. Finally, the third reason for this act is, it is a remedy for concupiscence. Thus, St. Paul instructs married couples not to stay apart too long, lest they be tempted by Satan and burn with passion. This is a legitimate outlet for fallen man. Yet this purpose must come last in the ordering for charity to operate and marriage to last. The archangel Raphael explains this to Tobias in the book in the Bible, named after Tobias, saying that the devil has power to prevail over those who receive matrimony for the sake of lust. For those who put why first, they put themselves first, they will have to deal with the devil. He will come into their lives. He always seeks to divide people from God and from each other. In order to avoid this, the archangel advises Tobias to put God first in his marriage by spending their first three days together in prayer and to unite as husband and wife only after the third day. He said, when the third night is past, thou shalt take the virgin with the fear of the Lord. Moved rather for love of children than for lust, that in the seed of Abraham thou mayest obtain a blessing in children. Tobias obeyed this advice from heaven. And so we read, Then Tobias exhorted the virgin and said to her, Sarah, arise and let us pray to God today and tomorrow and the next day. Because for these three nights we are joined to God. And when the third night is over, we will be in our own wedlock. For we are the children of saints. And we must not be joined together like heathens that know not God. Tobias followed the pattern of J-O-Y. And the church has honored and loved him ever since. Marriages that follow this pattern do not get divorced easily. And they produce saints. Now, not too long ago, Cardinal Octaviani addressed these matters during the discussions held at Vatican II. He was trying to counter the flattening or even inversion of the hierarchy that was being expressed at that moment. Many voices were saying the love of the spouse, the O in joy, could take precedence over God, over the J over the primary reason for the act. The good cardinal explained the hierarchy of the three purposes of the marital act as we just presented them. And then he taught the following. In the marital partnership, the love that is most anxiously desired so that the spouse's fervor may be steadfast, lasting, and profoundly happy is a conjugal love of friendship of the man and the woman for one another. What's he saying? O must come before Y. Once you have J, then they should serve each other. In a mutual friendship of conjugal love. Then he adds this. In marital life, and especially in the marital act, there is also a sensory delight that the spouses may desire for its own sake insofar as it is united to a decent marital act. Okay, what's he saying? It's okay to have why? The sensory delight for self, but it must be in its proper place. 
united to a decent marital act that is for Jesus first and others second. He goes on. The natural course of things in marital life is such that when one of the spouses notices that the other is dominated by sensory love, by concupiscence, his love of friendship for him diminishes to the same extent. What's he saying? When Y is placed before O, the bond of marriage is under attack. Heading for divorce, maybe. Now, there has been an intense effort over the last decades to make the first two purposes of marriage equal or even flatten out the whole thing. This effort is nothing but a temptation to come down from the cross, a disordering of true charity. The results are plain for all to see. Legalized abortion, contraception, sterilization, viewing of impure images... On an incredible scale. Divorce. At a very high rate. Broken families and broken lives. And much, much more since the family is the building block of society. We're pulling the building blocks out. What's going to happen? Therefore, we must strive to abide by J-O-Y. And these evils will be reversed. In the trajectory that God has given us in the mysterious book of the Canticle of Canticles, a book that has a spousal love as its main thread or theme, we have learned since Christmas this much of the trajectory. Kiss me, draw me, show me. Bring me into the wine cellar and order charity in me. Marriage and family is a wine cellar where those who cooperate with God put charity in order to produce good and faithful souls to build up society and populate heaven. What an awesome responsibility. In the same book, we find a further continuation of God, mysterious trajectory of love and grace. For we read next in that book, Stay me up with flowers, stay me up with flowers. Compass me about with apples because I languish with love. Stay me up with flowers, yes, with the flowers of virtue and the vows of marriage. Vows keep us in the place set by God. Virtues keep the ordering that is required to maintain the vows so that our love is ordered first to God, second to others, and last to ourselves. Compass me about with apples, yes, with the fruits of grace from the tree of life, the cross. With the mass and the graces and of all the sacraments, we can keep our vows, we can grow in virtue and conquer all the trials this world and those under the world may throw our way. And when we languish with love, It will be ordered to God, not to self-pleasure. Eternal joys will flow from this effort. With charity and order, with vows kept and virtue practiced, the eternal joy of heaven is the promised reward. Where the watery tears of this life become the wine of divine delights. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Amen.